Michael Jackson. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with Ian Dale. Hello, very good evening. It's three minutes past eight on LBC. Welcome to the programme if you've just joined us, if you've been listening in the last hour. Thanks for sticking with us. It's, that, the whole subject of the earthquake it is, it's, as the last caller said, it's quite difficult to find original words because we all feel the same, don't we? We, we look at the pictures and you think, well, how on earth do people, uh, and the people who have survived, um, given that they have no shelter now, how do they, how do they survive for the next few weeks? Well, that's something you may want to ask the leader of the Liberal Democrats, Sir Ed Davey, who joins me for the next hour to take your calls. The number to call 0345 6060 973. Um, Ed, welcome. It's a long time since we've done this, isn't it? Yeah, I think, well, certainly <laughs> LBC. I think the last time we talked was when you did a podcast. Yes. When I launched uh, my book, The the Fight for Liberal Britain. Uh, and it was a long podcast. And it, it was, was a very long podcast, a very personal podcast. So if you mm-hmm. go back and listen to mm-hmm. that on the All Talk podcast feed. Let, let me just ask you about the earthquake, because... I, as I say, it's difficult to know to mm. find new words for it, but it's very rare that you you would see a disaster on this scale. More than twenty thousand people have lost their lives. Uh, our last caller in the last hour said the British government isn't doing enough. What do you think? Well, first of all, it is beyond shocking, and um, our hearts. I think everyone's hearts go out to the people in Turkey and Syria. And, you know, it's the earthquake itself and the devastation that's brought. It's the, the cold and the hunger and all the whole plight of thousands of people. So, yeah, I, I, everyone's heart goes out to them. I, I, I think the British government needs to do as much as it possibly can, working with the authorities in Turkey and Syria. It's a bit more difficult in Syria, as we know, um, but working over time, working with our allies, our partners, this is a humanitarian catastrophe on a scale we, we, we've rarely seen. So uh, they've got to do f- do as much as they possibly can. It's difficult to say whether they're doing enough. Um, but uh, I have a sense that there's a commitment in in, uh, in government. I'm not going to make a, a big issue of what they're doing now. Um, but I think like one of your callers said, it, it is to be regretted that overall, uh, not necessarily in this case, but overall, mm. uh, our support for some of the poorest people in the world has been cut. Well, I think one of the one of the good things in these circumstances, the International Development Minister, uh, Andrew Mitchell, everyone knows how committed he is mm-hmm. to this. And if he does need to shout for more money for the Treasury, um, I'm, I'm sure he will. Now, uh, we are streaming live on Global Play if you'd like to watch us over the next hour. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions and then it'll be over to you. Questions are coming in thick and fast. 0345 6060 973. Um, you probably heard me say in the talk up there that it seems to me that there's a huge opportunity for the Liberal Democrats now, given the unpopularity of the government. But you're going nowhere in the polls. You're, you're, you have been at the same level as the Greens and reform. Why is that? Why haven't you been able to make a breakthrough in the polls? Well, I think there's opportunity because this government is so appalling and we've got some really interesting ideas. But I disagree with how you characterise what's been happening. I mean, the three by-election victories, let's not dismiss them, right? These were in Tory heartlands in true blue Buckinghamshire and mm. Cheshire and Amersham. No one expected us to win, but, but we did. And then in North Shropshire, a seat the Conservatives held for 200 years. We came from third and, and won that. That was hugely exciting. And then, of course, uh, just last summer in East Devon in Tiverton Honiton, where we didn't just win the by-election, we overturned the largest majority ever overturned at a parliamentary by-election. So, excuse me if I, if I push well, back a little bit. But you know, you, you, where, where votes are actually cast is, is what matters. But you and I are long enough in the tooth to know that by-elections are by-elections, and the Liberal Democrats traditionally have always outperformed themselves in, in by-elections. And sure, all of those examples there that you gave, absolutely brilliant victories for the Liberal Democrats. I don't deny that at all. But a general election is very different. And if you were heading for a breakthrough of any kind of scale in a general election, you know as well as I do that the polls would not be showing you at 8, 9, 10, 11%. Well, uh, I did disagree. I think if you look at the evidence from those by-elections, we no, no, saw... forget the by-elections. Well, um, let me... I'll come on to an, uh, <laughs> another part, which is a good evidence in, in, in my support. But what was interesting, lifelong Tories were switching. And said so they weren't going to ever switch back because they're so fed up. They think the government's out of touch. Yeah, but they are switching now, but they're hopping over you to Labour. Well, not in seats like the Blue Wall. They really aren't. And let me take let me take your, your argument head on because last um, May, 
there was a set of local elections, not just uh, in a few areas, but across the whole of the United Kingdom, uh, but local elections in Scotland, in Wales, in England, and which party gained more councillors than any other party it was the Liberal Democrats. And we were winning in the north of England, we were winning in the south of mm. England, we were uh, doing really well in Scotland. Uh, and, you know, that really, I think, is important because you're right, in parliamentary barrel elections, you can, you can focus your resources uh, you, you know, we get party members who travel away to to to, to, uh, uh, to, to witness it <laughs> yeah and, and it's great the commitment to uh, our cause is really really strong but in a set of local elections across the uk that's much more difficult but we are finding lots of people when they were asked to cast their vote were voting for the Liberal democrats and part of that vote was they didn't like the Conservatives, and, and who can blame them? They're making such a mess of things. But a lot of it was a very positive vote to our local community champion. In many cases, Liberal Democrats are well known for representing their communities really, really well. And they liked a lot of things we were saying on the cost of living and tackling people's concerns on, on the economy, as well as the big issue around health and, and social care. So um, I've been really encouraged in seats where I think we can beat the Conservatives next time that, that things are going really well for us there. That's interesting you say that because in previous elections you, you've been fighting the Conservatives in one part of the country and Labour in another and sort of having a slightly different approach to each, understandably in, in some ways. But it seems to me now that you've kind of almost given up on the, the North and f winning seats from Labour and traditionally you have actually done that quite well. If you think think back to previous el elections, Southport, through, oh, actually, actually that was a Tory seat, seat. The, but the, one of the Manchester seats you held for, for, for some time, some seats in the North East. Uh, is that what you're going to do? You, you're just going to concentrate on trying to shatter that blue wall in the South of the next election? Well, uh, Leave uh, the others to Labour? Let's go to Manchester. Uh, there's two seats in Stockport in Greater Manchester Hazel Grove and Cheadle, where I think we can beat the Conservatives and take those seats. Take Sheffield, uh, Sheffield Hallam, which has been a Tory seat in in my lifetime. It's currently held by Labour. We've used to ha we used to hold it. Neck seat, wasn't um, it? Indeed, I, I think we can take that seat off Labour at the next election. Um, I, I actually think we could do re really well in a seat like Harrogate, for example. So there are seats in the north where I think we can beat the Conservatives, and indeed, in one case, Labour. Um, but you're right to say in the blue wall seats in a lot of London and the South East, Liberal Democrats are now the main opponents to the Conservatives. And if people want to see the Conservatives out of government, and I really want to see the Conservatives out of government, then the Liberal Democrat vote is the powerful vote to remove the Conservative and get a great local champion. Do, do you feel you get a fair crack of the whip in the media as a party? Because that's always been a complaint in the past that maybe you haven't been able to... You, you, because how many seats have you got now in Parliament? Well, we won 11 at the last election. We won three, three by-elections, so we got 14. 14. So, for example, the SNP get a question at, or two questions at PMQs every week. You get one if you're lucky. You, you can't... Every five weeks. But every five weeks. See, I mean, I would say that's completely unfair. But um, that it denies you a platform in Parliament. And is that? Do you find that's reflected in the media? I mean, I think I think LBC gives the Liberal Democrats quite a fair crack of the whip. But I, I do wonder sometimes whether some other broadcasters do. Well, it, I'm not going to pretend it's not frustrating. Uh, but it is what it is, and I'm not going to whinge and complain. My job is to lead the Liberal Democrats to beat Conservative MPs and SMP MPs and a Labour MP in Sheffield Hallam at the next election. I'm laser beam focused on that. I'm actually really proud of the party. We've been put forward a really positive agenda. For example, we led the way in the debate on the windfall tax, for example. We led the way on the idea of freezing the energy price cap to help people struggling with the cost of living. Uh, I believe the policy I announced uh, last weekend of a minimum wage for carers, which is two pounds an hour more than the national minimum wage, actually speaks to the problems that carers have. They're very underpaid and there's not enough of them. And because there's not enough carers, that hits our health service. But that is actually a good example where the first time I heard about that policy was 20 seconds ago. 
Yeah, well, I'm delighted you give me the cue to, <laughs> to, to, to say it, and I'll, I'll repeat it several it, times. It, I mean, it's, it's a policy that I, I would fully support because I think care, care are, it's, it's a scandal in this country. How, do you know, how do you know what? It is a scandal. Care. Do you know how big a scandal it is? We've got people leaving the carers' profession, looking after our elderly, our disabled, our most vulnerable people, and they're going to work in the supermarkets and in hospitality. Now, I've nothing against those jobs, right? Let's be, be clear. But I think people seeing the state of our care service, seeing the state of our NHS, know we absolutely have to recruit more more carers. And there is a skilled job, it's a tough job, uh, and I think we should value them more. That's why we think, Liberal Democrats think, there should be a carer's minimum wage. Uh, um, we've, we've talked about this in, in, in the past, certainly in, in the podcast that we mentioned at the beginning, about the fact that I mean, you are a carer yourself, you have a disabled son. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm a carer with my wife, and we get we get support from from carers, and it's one of the reasons I I know. I mean, we pay them more than uh, uh, than we're required to. I can assure you, um, but um, more than that, um, I've been a carer most of my life. I was a carer for my mum when she was terminally ill because my father had died when I was four. Uh, because she was uh, an only child, I did a lot of work for my grandmother who cared for me uh, when I was young, and I cared for her when she was. Uh, elderly, and now I care for my son. And the truth is, Ian, there are millions of people out there looking after loved ones. And that that family care, that unpaid care, is, again, totally not valued. And the NHS would literally fall over yeah. without families looking after loved ones. And uh, what I said when I became leader of the Dublin Democrats is I wanted uh, the party to be the voice of carers, the voice of family carers, uh, and the voice of professional carers. And I, I hope with the policies we've been putting forward uh, that we're making good on that promise. Well, I, I wanted you to say all of that because y- you know your onions on this subject and there, there are lots of politicians who in- inevitably talk about policies that, that they don't experience themselves. I mean, why, nobody can experience everything that they, they're mm. talking about in, in, in politics. But sometimes the personal really does become the professional, doesn't it? I mean, it, it, it impacts on your... You can't... I mean, it must impact on how you do your job as leader of the Liberal Democrats. You, you can't help help but take what you have in your personal life and you've had in, over your life in, into your politics, otherwise we wouldn't be human beings. And, um, you know, I'm very proud of something we achieved recently, which has got no coverage at all. Um, there's uh, been some benefits in the past, one called briefment support payment and, and widower's allowance. And in the past, if you weren't married, after your partner, the mother or father, died, the family, the children and the surviving partner weren't able to get that benefit because the parents were married. Mm. And that was so wrong because the need to look after that bereaved child, the bereaved children, doesn't matter about the marital status of the parents. And I'm so proud that... Uh, Liberal Democrats, with others, campaigned to turn that around. It was a big issue for me because, you know, I lost my father when I was four, as I said earlier, and so we sort of, was a really crucial part of our income. Uh, my parents had been married, so it wouldn't affect them, but I know that there are literally tens of thousands of people who weren't mm. getting that support despite bereavement because they weren't married. That was a disgrace. Now that's been overturned, and I'm so pleased that those people will get some help that they need. How do you think losing parents at such an early age affected your um, teenage years, your your 20s? Do you think you're a different person now, having gone through that experience? I'm, I think I must be. Um, I mean, when when you lose a father at a young age, you do notice it. Um, and, you know, you're, the relationship you have, or at least I had with my, my amazing mother, was extremely strong. And um, she was uh, terminally ill for about three years, and my brother and I looked after her at home, and inevitably I came even closer to her. Yeah. Um, and it was it was a difficult period, and as a, effectively a young carer, um, it was quite lonely at times, and it's one of the reasons I do quite a lot on, on for young carers. I was at a young carers conference in Chessington in my constituency at the weekend, and and the, some of these young carers that they re, they really need support because it affects their education. So it affected me. I, I don't know how else it affected me, Ian. To be honest, I mean, um, I think I, th- I think I think I'm more s- resilient. Actually, it can affect people in all different ways, and there'll be people out there who's who really suffered a result of bereavement at uh, at early age. And I, I think actually it probably made me more empathetic. I think it probably made me more resilient. Yeah. 
Right, we will go to your calls, not your calls, listener calls in a, in a minute. 0345 6060 if you have questions for Ed Davey, the leader of the Liberal Democrats. It's 16 minutes past eight. This is LBC. See, Ed Davey, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, is with me until nine o'clock. We're streaming live on Global Player. Uh, if you'd like to uh, give me a call, 0345 6060 Nikki is in Chelmsford. Hi, Nikki. Hello. Hello, Ian. Hello. What would you like to say? Um, yeah, honoured to speak to you. Um, I, I, my concern, I'm a lifelong Liberal Democrat voter. Um, I'm a party member as well. My concern is that we've abandoned our internationalist stance. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, yes we can. I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, 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 I can't put your cut out. Sorry, sorry, it's my phone. Uh, we've abandoned our internationalist stance. Um, the thing that I've, I'm pushing 50 now, and I joined the Lib Dems at 17 years old. I voted at 18. And the thing that actually excited me about the Lib Dems was that we were so internationalist, we were so pro European. And we've gone quiet on that. The last couple of years, we are almost like aligning with Labour that we're saying nothing about um, Europe anymore. Um, it's like the Brexiteers have won. I think this argument... Well, they have. Not argument, <laughs> I, I, I think this conversation is not unfinished. And I'm disappointed by the leadership of the Liberal Democrats that we've completely gone silent on it. It's something that I'm really, really passionate about. I'm, I'm about pro-European, and I want to hear my leadership saying something about that. Well, Nikki, thank you for the question. It's good to talk talk to you, and uh, thank you for being a, a party member. Let me reassure you, we, we will never, ever abandon our internationalism. We remain a 
pro-European party. I'm really passionate about British-European cooperation and um, I have talked a bit about it, to be honest. And I, I actually think the European debate is the elephant in the room. I don't think uh, other parties are talking about it, but to give you one example, Nikki, uh, of where I talked about it recently in my uh, speech in November, which was the speech that got delayed because our conference was delayed after uh, Her Majesty's uh, uh, tragic death, um, I talked about the, the barriers that have been put up thanks to this shocking trade deal uh, and castigated the government uh, for that. Um, you know, I do believe we need to have closer trading relationships. We've got to rebuild the trust, which has been absolutely damaged. So um, uh, let me say, uh, Nikki, we remain uh, proudly internationalist uh, and believe whether it's in Europe, NATO, UN, the climate change talks, so much. We The problems that we face here in the UK can only be solved if we work with other countries. I just, Ed, so Ed, I completely agree with you. Um, the problem that I find, the reason we're flatlining in the polls, I mean, go back to Nick Clegg, go back to uh, Paddy Ashdown. We, were, we, we had like 50, 60 MPs, and now we're down to, what, 12, 13? Um, we haven't got a voice, and it's so frustrating because we have got such a strong message, and I think, personally, it's just me, it's just me, but I think if we were out there putting our message across and being different from the Labour Party and being different from those... I'm not going to swear, but the Conservatives, mm. we would have a real case to push. And I, I just don't feel we're doing it. I just, it's frustrating for me because I love the party, I love my country, and I just feel we're getting nowhere. OK. Well, um, um, just, just to answer one point that Nikki made there about the Labour Party, How, what's the difference between your European policy and the Labour Party's? Ooh, so we talk about it uh, and we've got a, a commitment to it. Um, you know, as I understand it, uh, their policy is make Brexit work. Uh, they voted is for it, they, it yours? I well, mean... they, they voted for the trade deal, if you remember. Uh, Liberal Democrats voted against the trade deal. Uh, and we want to make sure we have closer trade relationships. So, with, so does with, Keir Starmer? Uh, well, um, he's got a difficult position, hasn't he? Because he voted for the deal, which caused all these problems. We've been really clear from the get-go, the deal was a bad deal. And, and in many ways, I regret to say, we've been proved, proved, proved right. I mean, the, the extra costs for our businesses have been huge. The damage to UK farming, the damage to, to fishermen, all the people who are promised so much by the Conservatives have been really let down. But that's, that, that's where I'm, I'm going to keep on saying we are passionate about British-European cooperation. We know, it, you know it's going to take time to rebuild the trust, rebuild those relationships, but um, we, want to, we want that to happen. But there are only two viable policies, surely. One is to make Brexit work, and the other is to say Brexit will never work, so therefore we should rejoin. Look, I think you've got to face the situation as it is now, and the relationships between Britain and, and our European friends has been broken by the Conservatives, and it will take some time to rebuild that, I'm determined that the Liberal Democrats will play a very active role in rebuilding those relationships. And that, that, that can take us into okay. trade, from an electoral into security, dealing with international crime, for example. From an electoral point of view, though, surely it would make... I mean, if you're going after Conservative seats in the South, many of those Conservative voters that you want to come over to you will have probably voted Remain. You're not going to get Brexit voters supporting it. I wouldn't have thought, but, you, I mean, anything's possible, I suppose. Well, it's interesting you say that because in the by-elections, we had a, a lot of people who'd voted Conservative in 2019, mm. who'd voted Leave in the referendum, who voted Liberal Democrat. So, you know, I, I believe the party that I'm leading can appeal to across the divide. And one thing I really don't think is good in our politics is to always look back, particularly at a time when the country was so divided. I think a real statesmanlike party and a statesmanlike position is to find ways to bring people together. And what is would bring people together, I think, is people want close relationships. They want friendly relationships. But, but they don't we, they don't want the we nastiness. All know, the we all know that in your heart of hearts you would like to rejoin. All of your MPs would be united in that position. Most of your party members, I suspect, would be united in that position. And the electorate would understand that as a clear dividing line between you and the Conservatives and, indeed, Labour at, at, at the moment. So 
do you not regret this new policy of sort of almost strategic ambiguity, no. which people I well, think I, are going to find very I, confusing? I don't, I don't think that's a policy. I mean, pe- we couldn't be clearer that we are opposed Brexit. We campaigned against it and we fought against it. What happened happened. We voted against the trade deal. Uh, we are talking about the problems that that has caused and how we step by step want to deal with those problems, deal with the problems that the Conservatives have given our, our country. Uh, and whether it's taking down those trade barriers that the Conservatives have built very costly for business, putting prices up, very damaging. And um, that's what we'll do. And, you know, I think that is actually the sort of practical policy that those Conservatives that you talked about uh, in the blue wall seats where we are the main opposition, I think they'll like that. But I also think those people who voted leave but were Tory voters actually will respect that position because many of them actually believe we should be trading with our European partners far more than we are. Uh, Nick in Slough says, simple question, should MPs accept their pay rise? They've been awarded a pay rise today the same as the public sector. I think it's 2.9%. Um, just so everyone knows, I'm sure Nick knows, um, IPSA, the Independent Palm Tree Standards Authority, set uh, the salaries for MPs, for our staff, um, and they have an independent decision. Um, actually, it's news to me that the proposal was 2.9%. Um, I think that sounds about right. I think it should be way below inflation. It should be, it should be um, at the bottom of the scale. Um, I'm actually arguing elsewhere that nurses should be paid more, that ambulance drivers should be paid more. There's a shortage of them. We desperately need them in the health service. I can't understand why the government isn't getting around the table and making sure our nurses are paid more. Um, I think everyone would like nurses to be paid more. Everyone would like teachers to be paid more. But in the end, um, the, the government will say that it only has so much money to go around. And if they agree a 10%, 12% rise for the nurses, then every other public sector uh, worker is going to want the same. And and that is unrealistic. You were part of a government that started cutting nurses' pay back in the 20, 2010 to 2015 era. Well, one of the arguments, I think, for giving nurses a fair pay deal um, is partly inflation, but it's also the shortages of nurses. And when you look across the crisis in our NHS, the real big factor you see time and time again, whether it's nurses, but particularly uh, social care workers, as we were talking about earlier, is there's just not enough of them. And people are leaving these professions. So if we don't value them, if we don't pay them uh, a decent wage, we're not going to be able to sort the, the health crisis out. And I think that's what people want to see. Okay, thank you very much, Ed. We will take more of your questions in a moment. 0345 6060 973. It's 8.30 on LBC News Headlines with Daryl Jackson. Sir Michael Palin and Daniel Craig are among the stars supporting the Disaster Emergency Committee's appeal to raise money following Monday's earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. More than 20,000 people have died. Rescue operations are continuing despite sub-zero temperatures and fears survivors remain trapped under buildings. MPs are getting a pay increase of nearly 3% from April. It takes their basic salary to over £86,000. And Donald Trump's Facebook and Instagram accounts have been reinstated after two years. The former US president's social media platforms were suspended in 2021, a day after hundreds of his supporters stormed the US Capitol building. LBC weather fine and dry in the south tonight with widespread sharp frost, clouding over with occasional rain in the northwest and north, a low of minus three degrees. This is LBC.
Davey here, the leader of the Liberal Democrats. The number to call if you'd like to put a question to him is 0345 6060 973. And also, you might want to tell us, what puts you off voting Liberal Democrat? Because there are so many people now who've become disillusioned with the government. Their vote is up for grabs. Now, Labour seem to be doing incredibly well in the polls, 20-25% leads. They seem to be mopping up all of the sort of dissatisfied of Tunbridge Wells type of... Well, maybe not Tunbridge Wells, but you know what I mean. I think, I think Tunbridge <laughs> Wells has got a Liberal Democrat I think Tunbridge Wells... It has, well, I live there, so I know it does. Right. Um, right, let's go to another call. It's from Maria in Doncaster. Hello, Maria. Hello, Ed, and hello, Ian. Hi. And thank you for having me on. What would you like um, to ask? It's the first time I've heard... a a politician talk about carers with such empathy. Um, I have voted Liberal Democrat in the past. I am a a Labour voter traditionally. But um, it it seems to me that this man really understands the plight of carers in this country. Well, that's because he is one. Exactly. And what I'd like to know is, is what he would like to do for carers. And what what type of carer are you talking about specifically? Well, I've been a professional carer. I worked for a company in home care. I'm now a carer for my mum, who's 82. And I also look after my granddaughter, who's one, three days a week. I can't work because my responsibilities as a carer are so onerous. They're seven days a week. I'm only 61. I could work. But I can't because I have so much caring to do. Mm. And I can't have a pension because the government have deemed I've got to be 67 before I can get it, even though I have qualified for a full pension in my own right. You're a waspy. I am. I am. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, 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 don't apologise. I got an email uh, today. In fact, we just talked about it on the For The Many podcast where um, there's going to be a big march in London on International Women's Day on March the 8th by the Waspy women. Um, Ed, what well, I'd can... love to, but I can't. No, exactly. <laughs> Ed, what can you do for somebody in Maria's situation? Well, Maria, thank you for phoning in and, and thank you when you voted Liberal Democrat, but also thank you for those questions. Before I ask, can I, can I ask you a question, if I may? Um, yes. Uh, are you getting any help from your local authorities? Is, is anyone giving you any support? Well, no, there was a carers association that I used to attend, but it didn't really fill my need, to be honest. Um, I'm just on my own. I'm a widow, so I live on my own, but I cannot even live in my own house half the time because I'm so busy looking after other people. I guess you understand that. Well, it's amazing what you're doing. I mean, one thing that we want, and I, I sometimes in some areas you can get it, it's why I, I was asking about if you're getting help from your local council, is something called respite care, when you get a break for carers. where Yeah, um, I understand that. Yeah. If I need to go on holiday or whatever, my sister takes over. Um, right. She's not all that able herself. She's younger than me, but has more health problems than I do. Um, but my mum wouldn't like it. Right. That's a problem. Yeah, um, that, that's a common problem. Well, um, It's a very common problem because she's a diabetic with high blood pressure, aortic stenosis and gosh. various other ailments. So you can understand that, you know, um, her needs are critical. Yeah, and yeah. if I'm not there to supervise her, it could be life-threatening for her. Yeah, I mean... And similarly, my little granddaughter, who's one, her mum needs to work. So there's three days a week where I have got an 82-year-old and a one-year-old to look after, and I'm 61. Gosh, Marie, you've got a lot on your plate. I mean, you know your your story. I mean, it, it it shows how challenging it can be, and I bet there are a lot of listeners out there, Ian, who 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 actually have a similar situation, Maria. And I think your voices aren't heard enough. That's the the whole point. And um, uh, thank you for sharing those with us, Maria. What I you did ask me a question: what we should do for for family carers like yourself when you're looking after your mum, you're looking after your your your, your grand your grand uh, was it your daughter or your son? Grand my granddaughter. You brought your granddaughter. I mean, the three the three things I've talked about the most have been first of all carers breaks that respite care, and you're right that doesn't work for everybody. But I think effort should be made to to help your mother be comfortable with someone coming in besides a family member because, because you know, you get tired as a carer and it can take a lot of toll on your health. So I still think carer's breaks are really important. I think cash, you know, the carer's allowance is the lowest 
uh, of any support that's available uh, in the states, the, the lowest. And during during the pandemic, you, you may remember they put universal credit up by twenty quid a week. I asked uh, Boris Johnson, who was Prime Minister, I said, could you put carers' allowance up by 20 quid a week at the same time? Because you know, carers are having to do more work during the pandemic. They can't get help from outside. And I'm afraid Boris and the Conservative government just refuse to do that. But I do think there's a very strong case for, for increasing carers' allowance. And there's a piece of legislation that I've put forward, Maria, um, to try to help people who are caring but also want to do some work, whether it's part-time or whatever, to be able to give them more rights in the workplace. And I, I've worked with uh, a charity I'm patron of called the Disability Rights uh, uh, Organisation. Um, and um, the, we, we've come up with this piece of legislation, gone through all the, all, all, all the loopholes, uh, to in order to make sure that if this legislation got became law, you as a carer doing a bit of work would have your 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 position protected. And I think if we're going to go forward, we need to give people more rights who are carers so they can balance working and, 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 and caring. I think it's critical. OK, Maria, thank you very much indeed. Let's go to Chris in Richmond. Hi, Chris. Hi, Ed. Good to speak to you. Um, so I used to be a member of the party until a couple of years ago, and I dropped out for the simple reason I can't stand the party's attitude to the trans issue. Right, it's become far too tribal. You're not allowed to have a proper debate. I want a straight question to ask you, right? I'm English. I moved to Scotland. I identify as a woman for three months. Can I, become, can, I, can I then join and become an all-women shortlist member next time there's a selection? I think under the party rules in Scotland, which I'm not absolutely over the top of because uh, I'm an English MP, but I think you probably could. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, Chris, that you, you don't agree with the party position, but... Um, well, it's not only that. He doesn't agree with the fact that there's you're not allowed to have a debate within the party on it. I think that's yeah. his complaint. Well, uh, Can I give you a simple example? Can I give you yeah, a simple please example? Please do, right? please do. Please so do. The, the Lib Dems set out a, a, basically a definition of transphobia, right, which had the most absurd comments. For example, I could, if I made a link between gender dysphoria and autism, and I have an autistic daughter myself, that was against the party rules. Right. They basically copied and pasted the anti-Semitism rules and replaced it. The party now has realised that they need to wake up and smell the coffee and change those to allow gender critical views to be portrayed. And yet trans members of the party have asked for two separate legal opinions again because they're resisting that change. Gender critical people are not welcome in a party. Well, Members like Sarah Lovett are getting abuse on social media all the time. Ed, you have got to deal with this issue if you want people to stay with the party. You have to. Well, well Chris, I think um, you actually pointed to a way that we have actually done that because we've taken the issue very seriously. Um, we don't want to, uh, to, to push people away. And the, the body that looks after the board, the, the, these sorts of rules, the federal board, we call it in, in the Lib Dems, uh, they did review the definition of transphobia in the party. You're absolutely right. They took legal advice and we took legal advice about what the law was and, and how we would balance the need to protect trans people. Let's face it, who it's a lot of discrimination, a lot of harassment. It, it, it's shocking uh, how they're discriminated against. But we wanted to make sure that we, our legal definition was right. And we've changed definition because we've listened and we've taken advice. And I think that's the proper way to, to manage a party. But if I, as a Liberal Democrat party member which I'm not, but imagine I was. You'll be very welcome. Thank you very much. Um, if I said in a Liberal Democrat party meeting, I don't believe that you can just become a woman by declaring you're a woman, I could be chucked out of the party. It's my understanding of the rules. Uh, I don't think that is the case. Um, uh, I, I think the definition that's been accepted would would um, enable people, people could still make a complaint, right? That's mm. everyone's right doesn't matter what the issue is, people can still make a complaint. And the legal definition that we've adopted from the legal advice would be used to judge that complaint. And so I'm not going to prejudge how that would be dealt with, but we wanted to make sure we had a complaints process that followed the law uh, and was a proper process so everyone got a fair hearing. And I think that's what any, any party should do. I'd be surprised if other parties don't take the same approach. Chris, can you imagine returning to the Lib Dems? I could. If, if, they can, if they can get the, the ducks in a row on that, great. Well, are you going to, Ed, also readmit any party members that were expelled for having views that didn't charm in the party, like uh, someone wearing a T-shirt saying adult human female? You know? 
Well, you um, know, things like that, which that's just, it's just, you know, this. Well, someone absurd. was expelled from the Liberal Democrats for wearing a t shirt with those furniture. words on. Well, uh, let's also, whenever there comes a case like this, <laughs> Uh, where there's some being disciplinary or complaint and there's been a, a sanction or whatever, I think one needs to recognise that you need to know the details of that. I don't know the details of that particular case. It's dealt with by a proper process. I've explained before that we've taken legal advice to make sure that process is fair to everybody, and I think that's the, the right way to go on. It's not my job to expel people or bring people people back. There's a well, I, process. I've, I've got and the, I think that's the right I've way. I've got the case up here. Natalie Bird, I don't know if you know her. Um, she I, uh, was barred from standing for Parliament because she wore a T-shirt to a Lib Dem meeting that said, woman, adult, woman, colon, adult, human, female. I mean, un, under what planet is that controversial? Well, as I said, I, I'm not aware of all the details of that You must case. be aware of that one. Well, I'm, I'm aware of Natalie Bird, that has been the case, but I don't know the details of the case. I wasn't on the complaints process, Ian, as you could Well, I've, I've, just, I've my... just given you the, the what she did. I mean, do, well, you... would you object to somebody wearing a T-shirt with those words on? Well, the, the point I'm making about the process is it will depend on each individual case. I don't know whether it was just the T-shirt or other things, and you wouldn't expect me to know that, surely. Do you... And just final question on this, because I remember this came up um, when you were here with Leila in the leadership contest mm -hmm. and we had a question on it. And I thought that you both tied yourselves up in knots on it. And since then, every other political party has tied themselves up in knots on it. Why, why is this, this issue? Why has it become so totemic for people? I think that's a really great question. And I think it's because there's, the feelings on both sides are, are very strong. And they're, they're passionately held, and I think we should recognise that. And one thing I've tried to do in my comments, both in the party and elsewhere, elsewhere, is try to get over the fact that this is a sensitive issue which should be treated with compassion and sensitivity. And I think once you do that, you can bring people together. Uh, and you know, I, I have argued that um, when people have really wanted to know exactly what I think, I said, look, um, there are people who whose gender is the same as it, uh, their biological sex at birth. Uh, that's the vast majority of people. But there are some people who feel their gender is different. There's not very many, but, but there are some. And I think in a society that believes in equality and fairness, that we should um, respect that. And moreover, let's face it, the law of the land has for, for decades now. And given people whose gender is different from their uh, biological sex at birth they've given them protection and rights and that's exactly how it should be and and i, I will defend uh, trans people's rights they're human rights okay we have 15 more minutes for questions to ed davy 0345 6060 actually on the question of your name yeah <laughs> Is that a question? Just before we go to a break, <laughs> there is a question on this because it's from Chris. He says, um, does Sir Ed Davey think along with Sir Keir Starmer that being knighted doesn't sit well with the common working man? <laughs> I presume woman as well. Uh, listen, I, I am a very proud that uh, I was knighted by the late, ma late Queen. It was a really massive moment for me, you can imagine. And it was for the work that I did on climate change uh, and renewables. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud of that. Um, but um, in being proud of that doesn't mean I want to uh, talk about it the whole time. You you know, see, most people just call me Ed and I'm very happy with that. It, it's really weird because I often, I mean, I, I've had people criticise me for calling Keir Starmer Sir Keir Starmer. And I said, well, that is his name. If he didn't want the title, he shouldn't have accepted it. And it's it's a bit the same here, isn't I, it? In that, I, I'm I mean, not you complaining. And I, you I'm and not... I know each other. I would never call you Sir Ed in our private conversations, not because I don't respect you. It's just it just feels a bit weird if you yeah. know someone. <laughs> it is a bit weird. I tell you, my <laughs> wife doesn't call me Sir Ed. <laughs> Only in certain situations. Uh, it's 8.48. LBC. <laughs>
Ash is a first time caller in Greenwich. Hello, Ash. Ian and good evening, um, Sir Ed. Um, I, I'm quite nervous. Uh, I'm just going to say how. Uh, I'm sh- uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. We can actually. Carry on. Okay. Um, so my question to Sir Ed is: um, obviously, during 2010, uh, the Liberal Democrats were in coalition with the Conservatives, and obviously, a policy in which the Lib Dems also agreed on was the increase in tuition fees or the introduction of tuition fees to 9,250. Um, pounds and because of that particular policy that not only affected me but a lot of young people across up and down the country um, I lost all hope in the Lib Dems and with the state of the Conservative Party and the Labour Party um, what policies or what's your ideas to re-encourage young people like myself to vote for you because to be honest if there's a general uh, election tomorrow I would have no idea who to vote for because I've lost all hope in unsafe in any politician right now so yeah that's why i called in well listen th- th- thank you very much uh, for the question ash and you didn't sound nervous so uh, thank you for it um in terms of winning you winning you back whether it's on uh, you support for students we, we we really want grants uh back uh they were part of the re- uh, package to make sure people from uh more disadvantaged Homes could could go to university, and the Conservatives, unfortunately, after twenty fifteen, got rid of those. Um, so there's you know that issue we would we would want to revisit. But in terms of other issues, I mean, we've been focusing on the cost of living. We think it's really unfair that these huge oil and gas companies are making tens of billions of pounds of profit. The Conservatives are refusing to tax that fairly to create a. A, a pool of money, which then they can help people with the with the cost of living, uh, because so millions of people are, are, are hurting, individuals, families, pensioners are hurting with the high inflation, and and I think energy bills could should continue to be supported by the government using uh, a windfall tax on oil and gas giants. I think that would be well, fair. They, are, they have imposed a windfall tax. They've copied your policy. I wish they had. It's it's not a proper windfall tax. Uh, the uh, Shell admitted in, in Q3 last year that it hadn't paid any because they'd used all the loopholes, the allowances that uh, Rishi Sunak had put in as, as Chancellor. So I would say to Ash, if you're struggling with your energy bills, Liberal Democrats have come up with a policy to pay for more support for you. And just this coming April, the Conservatives are proposing to put up energy bills. I can't hardly believe they're going to do this. Put them up by another £500. That's completely unnecessary. Uh, it would cost £3.1 billion not to do that. And that should come from the windfall tax and the oil, oil and, uh, and gas giants. Um, thank you very much for your question, Ash. Let me just throw in another question on, on the strikes that are going on at the moment. You were the minister who privatised Royal Mail, I believe. I was. Um, what do you make of the way that Royal Mail have um, been behaving uh, in recent years, um, hollowing out the company with the aim presumably of selling it off to a private equity fund um, and treating its workers terribly? Now, if you hadn't privatised them, that wouldn't be happening. Well, I I disagree with that. The way I uh, set it up uh, was to make sure employees had shares in the business. What I did was make sure that the pensions of the raw mail workers, which were their fund was in massive deficit, I managed to persuade the Treasury to give a bailout to that so raw mail workers whose pensions were threatened were were protected. And I'm really proud of that because I I said to the Treasury, look, you've bailed out the banks and the bankers, you will absolutely bail out raw mail workers. So that's what we did. Um, And in terms of what the strategy they're pursuing now, I think that that should be uh, looked into. Um, And I think... We need to make sure that employment law more broadly, whether it's for raw male workers el- elsewhere, treats people fairly. And one thing I've been very worried about with employment law is people who have insecure work, people who um, don't know the hours they're going to work in the next week, the next month, get told right at the last minute whether they're going to have a wage check at the end of the following uh, week. Um, th- they have very few rights. And that needs to be tackled. And I think it's a really big issue because there are literally millions of people who have such insecure work conditions, whether that's in the Royal Mail or elsewhere. Uh, Michael in Rains Park says, if the... Uh, no, actually, let, let me put him on the line. I thought it was a text for a moment there. Hello, Michael. What would you like to ask, Ed? 
Hi, Ian. Hi, Ed. Hi there. If the Lib Dems uh, end up uh, kingmaker after the next election, um, would you consider going into a coalition agreement after your experience um, in the uh, after the 2010 election, and specifically um, how you ended up uh, the in the election results of? 2015 and 2017. And just on a similar line, Jaden says, uh, would the Liberal Democrats be willing to work in coalition with either Sunak or Starmer? Right. Well, I mean, f- first of all, let me be really clear. My focus as Liberal Democrat leader is is doing well in the next election. And that's about primarily beating Conservative MPs because they're the ones we're fighting. And it's about putting forward our Liberal Democrat policies as, as you've been kind enough to allow me to do uh, tonight and thinking about what happens after next election it's a, it's a, it's another world but uh, people have heard me say this before i fought the conservatives all my life and during the coalition i was fighting them every day uh, and uh, my party is determined to get this conservative government uh, so you were out. in coalition with them yeah, and and, sure, and you can still... point to we're getting 75 percent of your manifesto promises through so um but, but in we some ways, that was but, a success for the Liberal Democrats, yeah, but, 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 even if it isn't seen as such. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think there were lots of th- good things we did. I mean, I'm particularly proud of what we did in renewable energy. Um, and I had to fight them to do that. They tried to stop me. Uh, and I fought every day uh, to get the renewable power, the offshore wind, the onshore wind, the solar, which actually has been really helpful for our country. It's made us more secure. Now renewable power well, is the cheapest well, well, and the most let, popular. Let me help you out on this because I don't. Th- I can conceive of no circumstances where you could go into the coalition with the Conservatives after the next election. Am I right? Well, listen, as I've been saying... I fought the Conservative all my life. Mm. Uh, we, we, Am we, I right? We, we want to remove them from government. It would look very odd, would it not, to put them back. But say we have a hung parliament with Labour as the biggest party. Um, you have far more in common with Keir Starmer than you probably do with the Conservative leadership. Would you at least consider some sort of arrangement, even, even if it isn't full coalition, with the Labour Party? Well, you're jumping many, many well, hoops Well, I, I am, there, but I, mean, and, you know, I think it's the sort of thing that people will want to know during the election campaign. Now, you can perfectly yeah, yeah. say to me, well, let's wait till the election campaign. But I think, again, people quite like to get a bit of an idea of where, you, where you're thinking. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about getting more Liberal Democrat yeah, MPs elected. But you're not going to win the election, are you? Well, um, I'm not predicting that. I mean, anything um, can uh, happen in politics uh, nowadays. And we've got Lee Anderson as deputy chairman of the Conservative <laughs> Party. <laughs> well, you make a fair point. <laughs> uh, th- things are very volatile in British politics. I will uh, agree with you totally there. But uh, as leader of a party, I have got to make sure that we have the councillors and MPs elected in much greater numbers. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm really proud that since becoming leader, we won three by-elections in Tory heartlands. No one had expected us to win them, but we were beating the Tories in their heartlands. I'm really proud that we had fantastic results in the local elections last May. And I think you know, we've got momentum. Uh, and in many of the areas that are going to be fought this coming May, which will probably be the last set of local elections before the next general election, many of those areas, it's Liberal Democrats who are the main opposition to the Conservatives. So we're really, really fighting Conservatives hard. Ed, thank you very much for being with us over the last hour. We'll do it again very soon. Thank you. Thank Um, you very much. We are going to move on in the next hour and talk about um, Ed Davies' spiritual hero, really, Lee Anderson. um, (laughs) (laughs) who this week was appointed Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party. Um, Already, within two days, he's become a bit of a controversial figure. Um, Lee Anderson, what are your thoughts? Do Do you like it when a politician says exactly what he's thinking? Or do you think, how can somebody, with some of the views that he has, we've heard he's in favour of the death penalty today, how can he be... In, the, uh, in a senior position within the Conservative Party. Does it make you less likely to vote Conservative? Or, dare I say it, does it make you more likely to vote Conservative? Your call's next. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, the Prince and Princess of Wales have lent their support to the Disasters Emergency Committee's earthquake appeal. William and Kate say they've been horrified by the harrowing images following the disaster in Turkey and Syria. 
More than 20,000 people are now confirmed to have died. Dr Zahir Salou is president of the charity Med Global, providing medical care to survivors, and told LBC conditions 